a choice right now, right now, between fear and love. It's just a rock. Out of the dark night of ignorance and into the shining light of truth. Expanding reality. A population of citizens capable of critical thinking. We don't see things as they are, we see them as we are. There's a, a level of reality where everything dissolves into an ocean of energy. We empower our experience by insisting on our authenticity. That's very profound. Very Expanding Reality. Welcome to Expanding Reality. I am your host, Brandon Thomas. On this episode, a fantastic one, guys. We have Andre Mitty stops by from Ascension of the Chessmen. I am so excited about this episode. We go balls deep on all kinds of crazy cool stuff. He tells us about uh, his uh, psychedelic experiences, some of the incredible people that he's had on his wonderful show, which, of course, will be linked down in the show notes, so you guys will absolutely love this episode. So uh, before we get to that, check out our affiliate links in the bottom of the show notes. Food, Forest Abundance, Get Your Freedom From Fear on uh, Libsyn if you want to start your own podcast. Do it through who I host through, which is Libsyn. They're wonderful. Also, Amazon is linked down there. Uh, if you want to buy any damn thing, actually, anything at all through Amazon, go ahead and run it through that link. It helps the show, and it costs you exactly what you were planning to spend anyway. Also, if you would like to expand your experience with us here on the show, you can do so at expandingrealitypodcast.com, also linked in the show notes. That is where links to Rockfin for all the premium content and live stuff. We've also got some crazy cool replays of lives that we've been doing over there are uh, too cool for YouTube, the things that we just won't put over there because they're way too informative, so we just don't mess with YouTube on it. Uh, they're for free over on the website, so go check it out. Also, socials and merchandise and all that stuff's over there, so it's a one-stop shop. Go check it out. It's very, very cool if that's something that you're into. So uh, without any further ado, guys, let's get to this wonderful conversation with Andre Mitty. All right, everybody out there in listening world, thank you so much for joining us again. We have an extremely special episode this time. We have Andre Mitty hanging out from Ascension of the Chessmen. I'm rocking the gear. There you go on camera. Uh, audio only audience. I will link that bitch in the show notes so you can check it out as well as all the ways to find him. Andre, how you been, dude? Great, man. How are you doing? Dude, every day above ground is a great day. Thank you for asking. Uh, what have you been up to? Oh, man. I've just been really just crushing it um podcasting man just um you know recording as many episodes as i possibly can finding out or finding as many diverse guests as i can um i've been focusing a lot on um psychedelics as of late um really finding some good guests um within that community and um really just finding out new perspectives and, um, you know, finding out more about myself as I go along as well. Um, just hearing different perspectives, every episode, man, it's like, you're always reassessing your own beliefs and opinions and, you know, just the way you carry yourself like on all levels. And that's been a, a process for me. That's been, super uplifting it's been um continual growth setbacks along the way but you know dealing with those in the best way i know how and um just keep moving forward man um enjoying life while i have time in between hell yeah and just keep moving forward that is it that is the advice uh, i gotta hook you up with carlos tanner you've got to get him on Yes, I have had him on as well. It's when the fuck are you sneaking well. these in? I can't keep up with you, dude, with this shit. You've yeah, just dude. been banging these out, man. Um, I'm a little behind then, uh, as you can tell, but um, it you just have a badass show, man. So um, I've been on it. It was number 48 uh, to infinity and beyond. Of course, guys, Great like episode. in all the ways. Dude, it was fun, man. You're just, and like this, dude, this is just going to be a hang, man. I have nothing written down. Like I have no Me notes. Neither. I've got no direction, but I know you and I are just going to kill this thing because that's what we do. Um, 
but I've also, um, you know, spoken with you on several panel shows, Alt Media United. I mean, you're in the fam. So this is just an awesome, awesome time just to get to hang out with you every time. So yeah. um, I, I love that you are just absolutely, like you said, crushing it. You just released 75 as this episode airs. It'll probably be 12 more. Uh, and you're uh, doing really, really well. So what has been this push to just, you know, uh, content is king it up uh, as you are doing right now? I'm just absolutely curious about the motivation. Oh um, man, it's, it's just been synchronicity after synchronicity, really. Like, um, there's been a lot going on in my personal life, family matters, relationship matters. Um, and it, it, it's just all been like a lot of weight on my shoulders. And I've always felt like since I was a little kid, like I always wanted that tattoo of the Atlas man, you know, carrying the world on his shoulders. And, you know, it, it sounds cool when you like, you know, say it out, but then when you really think about it, it's like, do I really want to carry all that? Like, am I ready to hold all that? And sometimes it can be overwhelming. And I, I feel like sometimes I take too much on, but um, really um, just people reaching out to me Um you know, meeting people through people like yourself. Um, I have you to thank for meeting Peter and um, Carlos. Um, awesome. Peter, love Gorman them both. For the audience. Mm -hmm. Or no, I haven't had Peter. I was thinking of um, delay lines. Uh, oh, shampoo, Peter shampoo, Shamp Peter shampoo. Oh my god, I'm yes, so no, I caught yeah. that episode. That's awesome, man. Yeah, okay, you did yeah, a killer yeah. job on that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, Peter's badass, man. And you got to get Peter Gorman on. That's what I was um, yeah, saying. Yeah, I need gotta, to get Peter Gorman on. Dude, I got you. I'm going to hook you up then. There you go. That's the one we were talking about. Okay. Yes, yes. That'd be wonderful. Just uh, just to meet someone that's uh, met Terrence McKenna um, would be phenomenal. Um, that's my goal is to get Dennis, Dennis on. That's a, well, just get him. You got it. Yeah, I, I reached out. I'm still growing my numbers. So that's the biggest thing is, you know, develop developing my marketing better and all that. Was that a request from them that you have higher numbers? Yeah. Ah, uh, they ask you for analytics. Yeah. It's a bummer, man. You know, yeah. A lot uh, of bigger guys are like that. No disrespect to Dennis. No, I love no, that no, guy. No, 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 no. You have to, I mean, imagine how many tens of thousands of podcasts. I mean, there's what right. two and a half million podcasts on the planet. So yeah. I mean, all of them want to talk to that dude. I get the gatekeeping process. It's just interesting that the metrics you know, I wonder though, I'm, I'm sure they do. I'm sure that they pop up every now and then. And by they, we mean like the people that have that amount of folks that want to talk to them, that they need a system like that. Like I completely get it. I get it. Um, uh, but you, you gotta have that. Uh, so I, I bet they do kind of like you and I do though. I've, I'm the same way with this show, dude. It's, it's just funny because I'm doing, I've been doing the two a week thing. And so it's just crazy. Uh, and you know, I keep threatening to drop it down to one, which I am going to do, uh, one free one, a part of this show will always be free and, um, a major, major part of it. Cause that's just, I believe in just giving it out. Um, but also I'm going to be spending that time on doing a bunch of other crazy cool stuff. I got like a bunch of crazy shit going. So I am going to drop this down to one episode guys. I'm, I'm doing it. But anyway, yeah. so the content you is king thing. I, well, I, I keep saying that and I'm just like, but like you, again, they just keep falling in, right? They just keep like, which is wonderful. It's, it's awesome. I say like, I don't mean to say it like it's bad or anything because it's incredible. It's like the coolest fucking feeling in the world. But when they, and so you want to get them in, you want to get it done, you want to get it produced well and the, and then put it out as quick as possible. And I get it, man. So um, just keep, keep going, man. I, I dig that you are in tune with that. Um, what, what made you start to follow that? Was there a change, you know, midway through your experience with your own show? Man, it, um, it's just been a learning process from day one. Um, to be honest, like I, I remember when I was first starting, you know, it was like, I got to ask these questions. Like I got to direct the conversation exactly this way. And if it didn't go that way, I'd feel like I wasn't doing my job or like I was failing, but in reality, it's like, no, you're learning as you go and you, you get in these spaces where it's just ebb and flow and you're just in this flow state like we are now. And, you know, it's just off script and, you know, you're just thinking as you go rather than, you know, uh, premeditated. And I think there's a rawness to that and, um, an authenticity that, um, goes beyond saying, man, I think, 
people really appreciate that sometimes, um, depending on where it goes. <laughs> sometimes, you know, it doesn't go anywhere, but I, I would say most often it it turns out better than you, you could ever expect. And um, that's what I've found because I've had many shows like that. And some guests are harder than others. I mean, it, it, it's just a matter of chemistry and how you vibe with another human being. I mean, we're all one. We all know that. But, um, you know, we do all have our slight differences. And um, sometimes that can cause friction. But, um, you know, what my show's all about, man, is just like finding the commonalities rather than focusing purely on the differences and allowing that to like eat us alive like a parasite to a host and like, um, you know, make us have a negative outlook and see people as like our enemy. And yeah, there is people that will come against us, but can we meet them? Can we meet them differently than they're, they're approaching us? Like, can we respond with love rather than, you know, that hate they might be coming at us with? They could not agree more. Uh, and whenever you talk about going into this with that feeling and that vibe, like that's that's the way to go. It it's the only way to maintain like a, in perfect word authenticity. That's that's the like name of it. And when you hit this flow state, man, that's that's what this is. And I forget who I was talking to. I think it was Natasha Koshenka. Uh, you should talk to her. You probably Great. have. <laughs> uh, and so uh, she and I were talking about this whole process and how you like about twenty minutes into a show. You know, like the first 20, you just want to cut out and throw away because, you know, um, if the object is to like grab, you know, and, and a lot of people don't understand this. This is like a lot of these people you're meeting for the first time over Zoom. You don't get a, f a first call. You know, you have no idea what their day has been like. And so and then you're like excited, you know, to speak to somebody um, like some of the amazing guests that you've had, man, you've just been killing it and you get like excited and everything. And then they get on and you have no idea uh, where you're going with this. And you got like five minutes to explain your shit and then you're on. And it's this interesting um, dynamic. And then there's this and this is is this, dude, this is this like get out of your own way, you know, which is like my number one thing I keep in my mind all the time. Get out of your own fucking way. And uh, that's how you get in this. And there's moments in shows, though. So tell me uh, one of your favorite moments in a show that you can remember, because I know you know what I'm talking about, uh, where the energy shifted from uh, that awkward meeting, you know, new meeting, just met you phase and, you know, kind of, is this a waste of my time phase? And then when it switched to they, you could see it in their eyes. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know I've had those moments. I, 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 I can't think of any specifically. I will say a couple that come to mind as far as just there was that sense of feeling even when I met you or, well, we had already talked on the phone. So we had already, you know, bonded a little bit, having a long conversation over the phone, but that's um, the way you, I prefer to do it. Like if I have my choice, I always ask for that, you know, but, but sometimes, you know, on certain guests and you know what I'm talking about, uh, you don't get oh, that yeah. luxury. So, yeah. Yeah. I would say, um, you and Chance um, are two that I remember distinctly being very free flowing. And, um, you know, I, I had things written down, but um, I don't think I looked at them once on e either one of those episodes. And that's a great feeling to have as a podcaster, because when you are in that state of I have to get these topics addressed, um, you do kind of overstress it and sometimes you tend to force things and, you know, get out of your sense of just feeling natural with the conversation. And it's because it's tough as a interviewer or a podcaster, anyone in, in those fields of work, like to listen to the other person talking while being ready to fire back your next question, because there's a fine balance <laughs> between that where, if you're focusing too much on the next question, you're not really listening to what they're telling you before that. You're not. And then figuring out people's speech patterns and breath patterns, because some people, I'm a fast talker. Some people are not. And my wife actually taught me this. She was like, you know, this guy's a slow talker. You have to talk differently. And it just, man, it struck me. And I was just like, okay, got it, got it. Because she's a great mirror to me, man. I'm just like, okay, what, what sucks about this? You know, how can I be better? And, um, Anyway, so that was one of the things, though. Um, it's it's crazy, though, man. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it's been surreal, man. Like, to tell you the truth, like, and for anyone out there listening, like, 
I'm an average Joe. Like uh, I wasn't an Italian musician like Brandon. <laughs> no, like, you, he's a natural, yeah. <laughs> killing it. He played a um, little bit. <laughs> I played piano when I was really young, but um, I always had aspirations to be a stand-up comedian. I really looked up to Chris Farley growing up. I loved it, him on SNL and you know all, in all his movies, Tommy Boy and Black Sheep, and um, you know hearing stories. My cousin partied with him at Wisconsin, and he showed up to the their frat house and knocked on the door at three or four in the morning and gets up on the table drunk as hell and you know falls flat on the floor like literally out of the movie Tommy Boy and like my cousin told me this story like when I was really young looking up to Chris Farley so I always like emulated that and like wanted to be like Chris and something I always liked about Chris too was you know regardless of how you feel on religion um, some people use that as their spiritual outlet and you know throughout all his drug days and you know the worst of the worst of it man like he was still getting up and dragging himself into church on sunday mornings like just showing his dedication to wanting to be close to something higher than himself i guess and uh i always respected that about him yeah yeah no that is uh, an interesting he was so devoted to that and um, perhaps it was because he was looking for answers because he was a very, you know, reportedly a very depressed person. And, you know, I think a lot of comedians are, and that's their outlet for that. That's their therapy is what I've heard. I'm no comedian, but it, uh, it, it seems interesting with him too, because of his drug and drinking problem and all that kind of stuff. So maybe he was looking for answers, you know, and maybe he also thought that, well, I go to church every Sunday. So it'll excuse any behavior I have during any other time. Right. So I don't know, man, uh, who knows what the psychologist, Psychology was, but uh, we miss him, man. Very talented dude. Because I'm with you. I loved Tommy Boy and Black Sheep, or Tommy Boy Two, and um, it was cool. It was just a wonderful actor, dude. And we we miss the shit out of him for sure. Yeah, rest in peace, Chris. Uh, yeah, I mean, so uh, I, I looked up to him a lot. I I always had aspirations of getting into comedy, uh, making people laugh. Um, I remember being Farley at the talent show in fifth grade and you know doing the matt foley skit falling on the table and you know had to switch out a few words you know uh flipping burgers instead of uh you know rolling doobies yes yes (laughs) but um so you know growing growing up um at an early age i i always wanted to make people laugh and you know just find things that you know you could get out of your comfort zone a bit and you can kind of push the envelope further um, in that comedic realm where, you know, people don't know if you're joking or serious, so you can kind of get away with some shit. You know, George Carlin was a genius at that bill Hicks. I mean, a lot of them. And um, so I, I, uh, I've had a crazy life. Um, I, I remember the night, the night before my senior pitchers, I, uh, decided to try acid for the first time and uh, <laughs> ended up uh, not realizing like you'd be tripping for so long. And then I wake up and my pupils are still huge. And here I am taking my senior pictures. So that was a good memory to look back on. And then, you know, I, I was always looking for more like uh, growing up Catholic, being forced into Catholic school and, you know, at one point in my life in sixth grade, I was going to church six out of seven days a week. And, uh, you know, that's like some heavy indoctrination. That's too much. And yeah. yeah and uh, so, you know, the more I started to research, I, I uh, heard about uh, that documentary about 9-11, um, Loose Change, watch that. Um, just before graduating high school and started uh, using cannabis pretty consistently at that time and um, watched a documentary called The Union, The Business Behind Getting High. And that really made me start to see there was so much more going on in the world than, you know, just chasing girls and playing sports, watching sports, you know, just what seemed like meaningless things once you get into those deeper waters. And, uh, you know, as I started to swim deeper, I, you know, 
started to keep searching for answers. And, you know, that led me to a Pentecostal church, um, found an awesome pastor there I related to on so many levels. And, you know, he, he had told me he found God and was called to become a pastor through a LSD experience that he had had, you know, this chessboard flew off the table in this trap house he was living in in Michigan. And this one, uh, chess piece was stuck on the board standing straight up all the other ones were all over the place and it happened to be a white king so he saw that as like a divine revelation like this is your message to you know go speak the word of god i guess and uh i always found that fascinating and he was also a wrestler i was a wrestler so we had those commonalities and you know heavy use of cannabis at the same age and um so i i I had really started to um enjoy this church and you know started seeing people speaking in tongues and you know it's like the longer you're a part of something the more they actively want you to you know pull more weight and like take take on more responsibilities And right around that time, um, I had my first breakthrough LSD experience um, that really opened me up spiritually, made me realize we're all one, you know, feeling the vibrations of the the branches and the the trees, the uh, leaves just um, blowing in the wind. You can just feel the energy radiating off of them and giving life energy into you as you're breathing in and just having those revelations like that, that experience, um, with my four friends that day changed my life forever and really, um, made me realize like, and no disrespect to those who go to church. It just made me realize that, um, I didn't need church anymore at that point in my life. And I was searching for, you know, this God or, you know, just having that relationship or that that connection, that centeredness, that inner peace. Um, it's like I was searching externally um, in a church for that up to that point. Um, that that kind of message was revealed to me through that experience. And um, after that experience, um, I remember starting to get into meditation and starting to see the difference between meditation and prayer. I used to think they were one in the same, but I guess starting to, which some could make that argument. I think you could say, I don't know. I think there's a quote out there. It's like prayer is like um, talking to God, whereas meditation is listening to God, which I always like that. Yeah. I think a lot of the practices between new age uh, spirituality and uh, specifically Christianity, but a lot of other religions, Orthodox religions will parallel this, are very, very similar. The only difference is the intent. So uh, some of this stuff is very ritualistic, like the split between 3D and 5D and all this stuff, and people are just going to go missing, and some people are going to get stuck in a bad place because they didn't do it right. Uh, sounds a lot like the rapture, right? And so um, it it sounds, uh, some of the New Age shit, uh, spirituality stuff, and I don't, I'm not shitting on it, because if it works, it works. I'll make a point about it here in a second, but um, a lot of it to me just looks a lot of um, like a superstition with extra steps, you know what I mean? And I've said that before, but every time I record, I hold a piece of amethyst because my wife gave it to me and there's just something about it. So, I mean, there's, which will bring my point home that, uh, these things like this, like if you, if this makes you feel better, uh, or you feel more connected to somebody because they gave it to you, like, awesome. That sounds great. If, um, you know, you want to burn incense and stuff, I love incense. Like I burn the shit out of it, but not, you know, maybe for the same reason, like there's just, if you want to do any of that stuff, fucking go for it, you know? That's why I think that it's the intent behind it. Like there's no fear in spirituality, which is why it resonates with me the most is because it's absent of um, a need for scaring the shit out of you to, you know, even entertain their ideas because it's not, it's a come as you are thing, you know, just come on, uh, coming out, Uh, you're all welcome. And there's no, you know, price to pay, just be open-minded, you know, and come, come share your story. Like, what do you got? I, and so I, I dig that part of it and how there's no, you know, bad place to go because we're all one. Like, why, why would we do that? A lot of it resonates with me. I think so. Some of the like rituals, you know, that kind of mirror a little bit of religion, maybe a stair step into something to kind of 
I don't know, but for the, but for the transition spiritually, you know what I mean? Like there's, there's a connection to something familiar, but now you're reframing it in new context and putting a new light on it. You know what I mean? Kind of like the Christians did with Easter and Christmas and shit. We're just reappropriating. Yeah, exactly, man. Yeah, because it's ironic because at that time I had a lot of fear um, surrounding um, getting into conspiracies around that time. It was around 2012 and, you know, the end of days, the end of the Mayan calendar, all that stuff was going on. And I was like, like, you know, really looking at all these similarities and things and, you know, you connect all these dots and you start to create this reality that is like terrifying, which not to say like, there's not aspects of that in the world, of course. Um, But when you're not, you know, taking time out of your day to like actively care for yourself, meditate, like listen to stuff in your own direct personal life, You know, that stuff can take a toll on you if you don't take time out of it, unplug from it, you know, whether it's, you know, doing a mushroom ceremony for yourself or, you know, going on a meditation retreat, whatever you need to like unplug from that to the point where you can keep your sanity because it can kind of take you um, if you let it. And, uh, you know, I think Tripoli always says it's like if you stare at the abyss too long, it'll start staring back and, you know, you become the abyss essentially. And it's like you don't want that. Like you you want to, um, you know, stay centered and, you know, stay uplifted and, you know, stay upbeat because, you know, life is too short to have those worries and, you know, not laugh and not have fun and, you know, just appreciate the moment you have. And um, so I was really bought into the fear of all that. And that kind of drove me into church. And, uh, you know, I, I guess I was externalizing everything, which tends to happen when you get into the literalism of religion and, you know, taking the book of revelation as if it's, you know, a historical event that's going to take place on this day at this time. And it's like, ironically, I think somewhere in the Bible, it says like, no man man will know the time or or hour or something like that. Exactly. Which is ironic because when you buy into that, you're like contradicting a verse that's also in that same book. So you got to be careful with that. And, you know, I hope that touches anyone who's going through that, that might hear this, that, you know, that there's other people out there that have also went through that and there is a way out on the other side. And I I think it was genius. You had, you know, Blair McDaniel on, I also reached out to her and, you know, I, I think that work is so important for people coming out of religion like myself. And I really found, um, you know, through working with psychedelics and continue to, you know, want to learn more about, um, you know, using these things in a sacred way. And because I mean, you know, getting into LSD recreationally and, you know, ecstasy, any of that stuff, like the party drugs, they would say, um, you know, how they're advertised when you're coming up, growing up as a kid. And, and then you get into things like ayahuasca and, um, you know, San Pedro and peyote and iboga. I mean, these are, you know, indigenous, indigenous medicines. Like we need to approach these things a little differently. I would, I might add, and not to say you can't use, uh, MDMA or LSD medicinally, I I definitely sure have in the past. And um, I think there is um, a space for that. And not to say if you're not using, if you're using them responsibly, even at a festival or whatever, and you feel you're still getting something out of it that's positive. I mean, even if it's negative, I think there's always something to pull from it. Like, you know, it's, it's that ironic bad trip, you know, like, is it really bad or did you gain, did you, did you grow from it? You know, that's the question you got to ask every time. And um, I've for sure had bad experiences, but I look back on them knowing that I learned a lot from those experiences and learned essentially what not to do and how not to come to these medicines, because I think, I think they are medicines and I think they should be treated that way. You know, they shouldn't be abused. It's like, 
you know, we see in our culture, we see like it has to be in pill form to be considered medicine. And, you know, the big pharma way of look at, looking at things. And, you know, it's ironic because we also have this uh, opioid epidemic and, you know, people are popping these things like there's no tomorrow, you know, yet they're prescribed by a doctor um, whether they're bought off the street or not. And, you know, who's to say how many people that get prescribed are then selling their scripts. And, you know, it's just a continual uh, cycle of dysfunction. And, you know, I just think there's, there's so much rewiring that needs to be done as far as just how we look at um, health and ourselves and each other. And uh, I think, we've all had an opportunity to do a lot of self-reflection over the last two years and really think deeply about, you know, what are the choices we're making in our everyday lives and how are they affecting ourselves, you know, in the short term and in the long term, how are they affecting the people around us? Like we've just had so much time to think, you know, just time we really haven't had before because we were always, you know, taking vacations, you know, work, work, work. Like we didn't really stop and smell the roses. And I feel like we've kind of been forced to take that opportunity. Uh, you have. Uh, that seems like what all of this stuff is. It's the shadow work. It's it's everybody just hanging out and chilling. Um, one of the coolest things I heard the other day, and uh, you're the first person I've had on, so I'm going to tell you about it. So um, since I've heard it. So uh, there, it was this guy on TikTok, and I'm gonna I'm not gonna use the same example. He used chemtrails, but let's use um, pills and stuff like that. Okay, like these opioid um, prescription or otherwise. Okay. Anyway, the fact that they exist when something natural exists that would do way better. Okay, let's just put it that way. So uh, how he explained uh, that all things exist here from a perspective, and your perspective determines whether you view it through the third dimension, the fourth dimension, or the fifth dimension. Have you heard this? I have not. Dude, let's go deeper. Though. Check. Okay, Love here it. we go. All right. So check this out. So, um, so let's say that you look at the opioid addiction um, from a 3D perspective, meaning that it's in this area in which people who are in power, um, the people that you choose to follow because they're just there, they're authority figures. And you're just like, yep, that's it. Cause you're in a 3D mind. That's what your role is. Okay. It's a mindset thing. It's not a physical place, but it is a physical place. So I, uh, let's say you look at it that way and you are pilled out on this thing and that's what you need. And you live this existence and you, you know, whatever results from that results from that. And then you die. Okay. Well, if you see it, from a 3D perspective, that's your that's your outcome. But if you see it from a 4D perspective, that's when you look at it and you go, hang on, there's this other thing out here and pharmaceutical companies are actually, you know, and then you, you take it down all those rabbit holes and that's a four dimension view. And so that teaches you to see it, to ask questions, to calibrate, you know, where you stand on some stuff. And there's a little bit of anger and fear involved in the fourth dimension. And that's why you experience it that way. Now, what's cool is, is eventually um, you will get to the point of seeing it from a fifth dimension perspective, which is very interesting because now uh, you look at it and you see opportunity. So people like you and me look at that and we see opportunity in that, okay, well, we're just going to research alternatives and we're just going to not be dependent on those kinds of things. And we're going to be more proactive about our health and our mental health and all of the things that get people in the third dimension reality addicted to these 3D options that they have down there. But that's not in the fifth dimension. We don't do that. And so that's what's so cool about this, man, is it's actually here now and it's something you can choose to experience on all levels. Now, what's interesting too is that you're constantly seeing new things from a 3D perspective, but not always. What you're doing is you're being introduced to 3D things, but you have the choice rather to see them and interpret them with your 3D mind, 4D mind, or 5D mind because you've been in all of those. So you can actually pick, you know, which what your frequency is. And so you can hang out in the 5D if you'd like, you know. I love it's pretty it. cool. I like that perspective, right? It was it was interesting yeah. to hear. He was saying it uh, in comparison to chemtrails. And if I could find the guy, I'll tag him in this and stitch it somehow or something like that. But I thought it was cool. I I thought you'd get a kick out of it. What do you think? Yeah, that's deep, brother. I think, you know, it is so important to, you know, get outside of yourself and like just re-examine from all these different perspectives and just because that's really, you know, that's really what we're here for is to like, you know, solve the mystery, you know, at least try, you know, I don't think we're ever going to solve it, but why not, why not give it a shot? You know? 
Well, that's the question. Is it for us to solve? Like, do you think that it's it's meant to be solved here? I don't think so. Uh, okay, I'm going to trip you out. So let's say um, that you relive the same exact life over and over and over again until you figure out the secret to the universe. Mm. So That's a trip, dude. It is, because <laughs> if you think about it, I mean, this idea is not mine or anything, but um, whenever you go you know, to that tunnel of light, man, perhaps that's your mom's vagina, and you're just getting spit out again with the same choices, the same parents, the same options, everything you need to solve the mystery of the universe and get out of this bitch <laughs> is in that, you know, in the, in here somewhere, you know, and it's probably something innocuous. It's probably something you pass all the time. It's probably presented to you constantly. And you're just like, right. uh, it's, you know, but maybe you're just you, like, I'm not ready yet. Right. Yeah. <laughs> you're like, uh -uh. I want to stay here. <laughs> yeah. I like the sex. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's, uh, anyway. uh, well, right, right. Um, but you know, I think that there, there is though an element, I want to bring it back to what you said about the, um, experimentation with altered states is how I'll put it. Mm, and I think yeah. that, uh, we do go into it like that. Cause I, uh, mirror your story quite a bit. Um, uh, acid trip for the very first time I ever took hallucination, uh, hallucinogens in high school, uh, as a senior in high school. And then yeah. I, um, had a horrible fucking trip. That was really, really bad. And I think that there's some value in that. We can come back to it if you'd like. But uh, the, it then, um, you know, uh, 2001 is when I graduated high school. So I'm 39. Uh, so I um, remember that being a catalyst, your catalyst was loose change, which is very interesting. Mine was like around zeitgeist like that. Mm, and then some yeah. other things happened, but psychedelics and then conspiracy theories and then spirituality, because I found that, uh, well, it was given to me conversations with God, Neil Donald Walsh. And uh, that order is what I did it in. And it sounds like you had the exact same experience, which is very, very interesting. So that's pretty cool. But um, I do think, though, that there's nothing wrong with doing it recreationally. I know a lot of people, I wouldn't treat ayahuasca that way. And that's just because it's different in my mind. I know that from anyone's perspective, any of this is going to make no sense whatsoever, but it's going to be important to them that I miss the one that's important to them. So anyway, um, but that being said, I will say that like mushrooms, for instance, I mean, God damn it, they're fun. And you, know, you go out and you, you take a few cabs, even microdosing is, is meant to be a mood oh, yeah. enhancer. So you're kind of doing that recreationally, right? But I, I get the sacredness of it and I respect that uh, fully 100%, but I go into it. I'm like, as I'm popping them, I'm like, hey guys, we're just going to go Oh, Check yeah. out some shit and make stuff be pretty for me and have some fun and make me giggle. And, um, you know, I don't I don't think that there's anything wrong with that. I know there's a million people and please email me. I'd love to hear your perspective. Uh, they're sitting there saying, no, 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 that's incorrect. And um, they're all sacred. And But that's the thing, right? I mean, if you go into it, because there's been a lot of sacred experiences I've had where I've gone into things thinking it was one thing and needed to go in with that illusion to have the experience that I had. It's like the Matrix thing. Whenever he goes to the Oracle and she said, you're not the one. He was the one, but she told him what he needed to hear, right? So what's one of those for you, man? Have you had one of those just fucking mind-blowing experiences where you went into it to just get fucked up and then uh, it ended up just expanding your world so crazily? Oh, yeah. So many times, man. I feel like, you know, y you always get that sense and it just made me think of like, you know, there's been many um, experiences I've had in the past where you know, you're like, well, we're going to watch these movies or we're going to play that Pink Floyd soundtrack yeah, over the with, Wizard of Oz. Yeah, yes. with Wizard of Oz. <laughs> it's like you have all these grand ideas. And then once you're in the experience, you're like, we're throwing those plans out the window. <laughs> yeah, none of that shit happens. No, never. none of that shit happens. You get fucked up and you stare at your hand. You know, yep. your friends try to keep you out of the mirror. Yep. That's what happens. Yep. Yeah. Go yeah, outside. That Go outside. Yeah. The old don't look in the mirror trick. I, I think, I think, uh, there is a point to look in the mirror. Um, but set, set a time limit. Like, yeah. you know, have a timer, like a bell. Yeah. 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 Just have someone come and get you. If you have a trip setter, like don't let it, don't stay there longer than you need to, because you know, I you go Wolfman, really go <laughs> Wolfman yeah. every time. I turn into goddamn Wolfman every fucking time. There's no other like Octurian or some fucking awesome thing like Mantis, even like some insectoid. Nope, Wolfman every fucking time. Oh yeah, it's odd. Yeah, I mean um, to tell you the truth, man. Like even uh, going to drink ayahuasca the first time, um, you know, I was going into it not knowing what to expect. I I had had you know, many experiences with LSD and, 
tried DMT a few times. Um, never felt like I truly broke through on DMT. You know, I think I needed to take that third or fourth hit more, more fully or something. But, um, I mean, I had felt that a little bit, had that breakthrough LSD experience, had many other profound LSD experiences and mushroom experiences. And, you know, there, there was just something different about ayahuasca though. And, um, you know, my girlfriend and I, at the time, um, we had just, we had decided to go our separate ways. You know, we had our disagreements and we'd been together six years at the time. And, um, we decided, well, she, she had, uh, drank an ayahuasca uh, at the same place. Uh, it's called soul quest. It was down in Florida, Orlando. Uh, she had, she had went down previously, like probably six months before this. And, you know, she, I knew, I noticed something different. There was something different about her when she got back. Like she just had this, um, you know, different energy and, you know, in a good way. And she was just all smiles. And, you know, um, I think we were both learning, um, you know, the process of integration. And, um, so she was, you know, it's, it's hard when you come back from an ayahuasca retreat and then you go back to your old life that you were trying to heal from yeah. and like, you know, get out of, and then you're right back in it. And it's like, what do I do now? Do I like go like fit back in just how I was or like, am I going to approach it differently? And that's like where you come to that crossroads and you're like, where do I turn? And, you know, I think for some people it takes multiple times before um, they really start to do the work and, you know, start to um, get the right, uh, get the right outlook on life after the experience to the point where they're like, I'm ready now. Like, uh, I'm taking this serious now. I'm going to not, not to the point where you're being so hard on yourself. You're like, I'm going to meditate 20 hours a day and, you know, not getting too crazy, but just holding yourself accountable and loving yourself enough to take better care of yourself, to do things for yourself, to do things for others, you know, just want to be a better person in all respects, whether it's, you know, if addiction has a hold on you, whatever it may be. Um, she, she at the time, you know, was struggling with alcohol and Adderall and um, through ayahuasca, she was able to release both of those addictions. And um, so I had noticed she had came back and, you know, really had this sense about her, this, this newfound, you know, just, difference in her. I, I don't know how to describe it. It's hard. To, it's hard to describe, but um, she was different in a good way. I'll say that. And so we had decided, uh, I guess we're going to uh, go drink ayahuasca as like a way of conscious uncoupling is what we called it. And uh, it was, it was interesting. Uh, so I went down there. I, I wasn't sure if this was the right choice, but at the same time, I was like, when, when am I ever going to get this opportunity again? You know, like this, this doesn't just happen. She had offered to uh, pay for some of it and uh, was really pushing it on me. And I, I, I had every reason not to, I was like, I'm just going to run away never talk to her again. And, you know, hate her guts. And it's like, I think when you end relationships like that, like it builds a lot of shit, shit within you of like, you're bringing that baggage into the next relationship. And then, uh, yeah, it's just not good. So I, uh, I went through with it and, uh, really had a life changing experience, man, that weekend. Um, just the community there, um, was beautiful. Uh, all the volunteers felt like freaking angels incarnated, uh, in the experience, just helping you, um, if, if you need a hand with anything and, you know, just helping talk you through certain things and keeping you within yourself and not bothering others and, you know, just helping you along your journey. And, um, you know, I was, I was really struggling. Um, I, I remember, uh, 
there's this guy uh his name was also andre and uh i think he was from ukraine if i remember correctly and he was really having a tough time and this was before i was like really feeling it like it started to really kick in for me i mean it was starting like you could feel it you could feel it building and uh I look over at this guy and he's just yelling um, like all these obscenities and all these different languages and just screaming out and, you know, getting destructive, like kicking and screaming. And I'm, I'm just like trying to like stay within, yeah. <laughs> trying to yeah. put in my earplugs and like, I just keep looking over, man. And like, I keep getting distracted by it. And next thing you know, like I'm just in this like literal hell like your uh christian version of hell and like i feel like i'm in like in this like devilish cult or something and i'm like <laughs> like what do i got to do to get out of here then i thought like i was going to be like sacrificed to the gods and get butt raped like it was crazy dude <laughs> <laughs> and uh like uh through all that like through all the madness and all the craziness that led up to the very end of the journey that first night, um, you know, I was able to surrender finally. And it, it was ironic because the whole time it stemmed from, so I was like sitting on this patio area. It was like a concrete patio and you have your little cot you're, you're on and I'm looking directly at the fire and the fire's just calling my name. Um, but I'm, it's like in my head, I hear these two voices talking and it's like one voice is like, you need to go sit by the fire. And my other, my other voice is like, you're already sitting by the fire. What do you mean? Oh God. <laughs> and so I was like, I was like wrestling between these two. I was like, which one is it? Should I stay or should I go? And like, I could not surrender, dude. <laughs> and uh, the whole time it was like, just, just learning that, I need to like listen to that voice and not, not like second guess myself and just follow my intuition. And because what it was, was I, I was uh, on concrete versus like grounded in the grass and I just wanted to be in the grass by the fire. And like my mind was tricking me and it's like, no, 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 you're already on, you're already by the fire. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> like, why are you complaining? And it's like, it's that feeling that concrete jungle feeling, man. Like I, I was just having those vibes and it just took me to a bad place real quick. <laughs> Dude, that's crazy. So it, so you, you were close to the fire, but you just weren't on the grass or was it like a perpendicular move for you to be? Yeah. I just like to? literally got up like 20 feet and that was all. And from then on, I was like at peace. Like I felt like I was in the womb of mother earth. Like I was feeling all that unconditional love. I was always seeking, like it was there. Like I was, I felt all that love like come over me and I've never felt that feeling before in my life. Um, you know, I'm sure there's been times, um, throughout childhood. Um, but yeah, just getting that over sense, that overarching feeling of love, um, after, you know, going through hell to get there was such a, it just made me realize, man, like, what I overcame in that experience made me realize like all the small shit in life I get hung up on or, you know, someone cuts me off in traffic. Like that's nothing. It's a fly on the wall. You know, it, it's like once you've overcame um, a heavy obstacle, whether it's in life or through one of these journeys, it just gives you like ammunition to continue to respond in a better way when tough shit comes up in life. Great word for it, ammunition, and right there with you, absolutely. And that's what it feels like because you're out here taking those lessons into battle. That's like your danger room in X Men. You know, it's like your simulation. You know, it simulates these things. It downloads information. You get a sense of who you are based on your displacement of self, which is very, which is a very interesting process. But it, it's also like. I guess that's scalable. So um, back to what we were talking about, about bad trips. So I, I think that what's interesting about this is you go into psychedelic experiences. Most of us, not you, unfortunately, you poor bastard. Nobody <laughs> told you that you're going to be tripping that long on acid. But 
yeah. for most of us, we go into this knowing that you're, you're committed, you're going to be there for a minute. And so what I think a bad trip offers is it offers you perspective into the difference between pain and discomfort. So I think that that is the lesson that you carry on out of those kinds of things, because discomfort you can deal with, you know, just suck it up, whatever, look at it differently. You know, it's opportunity to be optimistic because you're in no real danger, right? But um, pain is something very, very different, and that's that's different. And so I think that that's what it helped me delineate was bad bad trips, and I've only had a couple. I want to say one for damn sure, but. Uh, I don't know either way, but uh, in those moments, I would think that um, the way, what I took again from it was um, pain versus discomfort, and discomfort, um, no big deal. So, yeah, um, I, I will say another another huge uh, revelation for me was just learning about integration um, throughout that weekend, man, and you know having integration ses- sessions in between ceremonies because it's like after that first ceremony, at least from you know a lot of people that are just meeting the medicine you're like oh god you wake up that next morning you're like i'm not doing that again <laughs> yep, i'm out <laughs> and That's then the sure thing. Enough, it takes a commitment you know you're you're committed to it you're invested in the idea because you know that that's where the healing happens or at least exactly. there's some mysteries to figure out in there and and i feel like that's your ego piping in saying you don't need to be here why are you here like we're great like we don't need the healing that needs to take place <laughs> like discomfort that is discomfort that you experience the next day uh there's no real pain you're in no real danger um you're just yeah. being a pussy suck it up yeah exactly man and you know um there the head head uh, minister down there at the time um he was the head integration guy. Uh, his name was Dr. Scott and he was from Lincoln, Nebraska, where I'm from. So and I was like, this is just a crazy synchronicity. And, um, you know, great guy. He's down in, he's down in the Amazon now, uh, helping get schools started down there for different tribes and doing really great work, still, uh, working with the medicine and, um, you know, he, he really, um, made me realize like all these archetypal things I was seeing in my experience were like all related to my childhood and like, you know, um, not getting the attention I desired or, you know, getting neglected in various ways and having to earn love, like, you know, having that condition love where it's like, Oh, I'll love you if you do this, this, and this. And maybe this too, rather than I'm just going to love you no matter what, you know, and just getting, getting to feel those feelings again, because I felt for so long up to that point, it was like, I was just smoking weed habitually, you know, numbing out, not really feeling those, those things that I had never taken the time to feel, I guess, because I had always like ran away from them, whether it was through sports or, um, you know, just just trying to um, fill that void within me and um, getting to work through some of that. And, um, you know, having never gone to therapy, that was like my first experience in that therapeutic setting of, all right, I'm just going to listen to you and without judgment and like hold you with open arms and, you know, just listen and be a shoulder to cry on. And, you know, that's a great feeling, man. And I feel like there's definitely a stigma with that and men in our culture of like, just fucking be tough and tough it out. You pussy. And it's like, you know, sooner or later, like you got to kind of cut that shit out and like find a balance of like, no, there, there is a time to like, you know, sit with your feelings and, uh, you know, validate them, you know, where's this coming from to not let it take power over you or, you know, lead you to have a worse and worse addiction than you already have by trying to escape from, um, that, that problem that might stem from childhood that you've never took the time to face. And, um, you know, just learning all these things about myself that I'd never really taken the time to, you know, get outside of myself and look at, and, um, you know, whether it was like codependency or all these, all these different, uh, negative self traits about myself, um, that I just reanalyzed and started to work on and try to shift in different ways in my life and catching these triggers as they were 
uh, coming up and trying to sell, set healthy boundaries with people that I felt I was giving too much of my energy to. And then I was left empty afterwards. And, you know, all these lessons we learn in different ways, but, you know, ayahuasca was kind of the path that led me there and really helped me a lot afterwards. I mean, finding the confidence to get on uh, stage and do stand up comedy for a five minute set the first time. That's so cool. Uh, did it with my dad. My dad closed the show. We took a stand up comedy course together and we had to perform at the end of it. Dude, you got to perform at the end of it. That's amazing. That's so Dude, cool. It was awesome. That's amazing. So just finding that confidence to perform stand up and then also finding my voice on my podcast, um, it really um, filled that creative outlet I was always trying to fill. I mean, I'd written poetry in the past and, you know, I, I, I did a lot of drawing growing up, but I felt like it finally was filling that void that was, was there uh, creatively that I was seeking. And I've always loved having these deep conversations with people and just seeing where they land, you know, no uncharted territory, like we're exploring all regions, you know, and I just wanted to be able to do that on, on a regular basis. And sometimes locally, you can't always get that opportunity. So to be in a position I am now to have that opportunity on a weekly basis, multiple times a week is a dream come true, man. And sometimes I pinch myself. Am I fucking dreaming? <laughs> yeah. Coolest thing ever. Absolutely. Could not agree with you more. That's the whole damn reason I started this was talk to a few people that had written some of these UFO books. And I was just like, huh, I, you know, I've heard tons of interviews that they've done with other people. I've never heard them been asked about this or nobody's ever gone down this vein. Or I wonder, you know, the last interview I heard of them was 10 years ago. So I wonder if there's anything new that they have to contribute to some of the new ideas, you know, that are coming out, whatever. And, um, you know, that was the motivation to do it and so uh, then it just turned into this incredible thing uh, where I get to hang out with folks like you like you weren't on my list of people to start to talk to whenever I started this show but god damn it you're on it now you know you were in the calendar I couldn't wait for tonight I was so excited about it I went and got the shirt back on because I had to wash it because uh, I was wearing it <laughs> So, uh, dude, Andre, I think we're going to call it here, man, just because I'm up against a commitment that I've got here. But, dude, uh, this is awesome, man. Uh, you are, of course, welcome any damn time. You know that, brother. Um, and I'll be linking all the ways to find you down in the show notes. So uh, just don't be a stranger, man. And thanks again for everything, dude. You're just such a badass. This was great. Love you, brother. Thank you. Love you back, my friend. We'll talk soon. Sounds great. Absolutely awesome, dude. Amazing to talk to Andre every single time. Make sure you check the links, guys, for his show, Ascension of the Chessmen. It is linked down there, and it is wonderful. Also, the direct link to my conversation on his show and his shirt that I was wearing for the show, for the video audience. Y'all saw it. Uh, check the links in the show notes for all the ways to find him. Absolutely amazing guy. Love the shit out of Andre. Thank you so much for coming by, Bubba. Also down in the show notes, uh, check our affiliate links with foodforestabundance.com. Get your freedom from fear on. As well as if you would like to start your own podcast, I host through a place called Libsyn. Highly, highly recommend it. And with that link, if you're wanting to start your own, no better time than now. And I highly encourage everyone who's even got the little itch to go ahead and start a podcast. It will change your life for the better. Use Libsyn and you get uh, two months free with your first month, I believe. So check that link. It's awesome. It's a great deal, whatever it is. Also, if you're going to buy any damn thing at all on Amazon, do it through our link. It's down in the show notes and it helps the show for something you were going to get anyway. Also, if you want to expand your experience here, uh, do so at the link in the show notes called expandingrealitypodcast.com. That is our website. It's got some amazing stuff going on on it. My buddy, Bo Shafnowski, who runs the website, a uh, huge production help, by the way. You guys check his link in the show notes. Uh, he has been doing some amazing stuff as far as adding new channels for free content that you can't get anywhere else. The Too Hot for YouTube stuff, uh, the uh, bonus videos, there's featured things. We're doing the replays of the lives that we're doing on Rockfin over there. A lot of cool things, and it's free. Just go go check it out. So also, uh, go out into this beautiful place, guys. Pick up a piece of Lita if you see it. Buy some money and line around you a coffee or a meal, something small. Makes massive ripple effects out into the collective. Get out of the left-hand lane if you've got somebody behind you wanting to pass. And of course, and above all, and any damn thing else, y'all go out into this beautiful place, whatever the hell this thing is, and just be good to one another. 
Thank you all so much for listening. We will see you next time.